Exodus chapter 24, please, and we're going to be looking at verse 12. This passage talks about the children of Israel as they are in Mount Sinai. Moses, God's man, is given the Ten Commandments. And before God separates Moses from the Jews, he has the Jews experience his glory. As a matter of fact, the Jews were able to hear God speak to them, not just to Moses, but to them. As he's given them the Ten Commandments, they heard his thunderous, majestic, awesome voice speaking directly the words of God in their very own human ears. And not only that, the 70 elders of Israel, they were able to have pretty much a marriage supper of the Lamb, so to speak, where they were able to feast and dine with the King of Kings himself at the very top of the mountain. The glory of the Lord shone all around the place, even during the time when Moses was separated from the Jews. During the 40 days of testing that the Jews were waiting for their leader to come back. During that trying time, even the glory of the Lord was still manifested in their very own eyes at the top of the mountain. If we read verse 12, <coughs> And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses, Out of the midst of the cloud... And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Now notice when Moses was separated from the Jews here, the Jews still saw the glory of God. I mean, the glory of God was not past. It was not over. I know that God spoke to the Jews. If you go four chapters behind at Exodus 20, God spoke to them audibly, and their very own human ears were able to witness and hear the very words of God. And I know that the 70 elders, they were able to feast with God on the top of Mount Sinai when you look at verse 9 through 11. But guess what? The glory of God was still ongoing. It was not done. It was still ongoing when you look at verse 16, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered his six days. Notice in verse 17, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Verse 18, Moses was in the mount 40 days. So without their leader, during that time of testing, when the Jews, they were without a leader and they had nothing going on and they were sitting down and wondering if Moses was alive or dead. And you might recall later on that they couldn't wait anymore. God was testing them 40 days and the Jews, they all of a sudden start to worship a golden calf because they don't know what happened to their leader. They were being tried and tested, and they were worried. They thought that they were going to be stranded in the mil middle of the wilderness, and they don't know if Moses is going to bring them into the promised land like he promised them. For all they know, he could have died up there because he wasn't gone for just a couple days. He was gone for 40 days. That's longer than a month. And when this church goes without their leader for one month, you would wonder what would happen and you would get worried too. But in the middle of that, verse 17, 
the glory of the Lord was still in their sight. They still saw God's glory manifested. It wasn't past. They ate with the king of kings, but that wasn't past. His glory was still manifested. They saw the fire. They saw his awesome power. They saw God revealing himself to them. And so even during their trying moment, God's glory was, the Bible says in verse 17, in the eyes of the children of Israel. They saw it with their very own eyes. They weren't walking by faith. They walked by sight here. They weren't being tried out in their Christian faith and they had to walk by faith and not by sight. And they had to have faith and belief in the invisible. No, no, they saw God's evidence and power and miracle and his own very own presence 24-7 in their eyes. They saw all that. So why would they go worship a golden calf? Why would they get discouraged and say, Moses is dead. He won't lead us out. Hey, look at the top of the mountain. Don't you see that? Don't you see God moving and manifesting? And church, when there are times that we go through our trying moments, the glory of the Lord is re being revealed. And we've seen the miracles. And you see it. I'm not saying faith here. You're not walking by faith. You saw it with your very own eyes, what God did with your life, what he saved you from. I mean, this is the closest to sight that we're ever going to get right here too. Manuscript evidence builds it up. You got the perfect, pure word of God and you saw answers to prayer. Not just believing, but you saw God answer your prayers. You saw the altars here, how people's lives were changed. You saw people getting baptized and now what they committed and surrendered to the Lord. You saw something different here than out there in the world. So why would you make God so oh Israel? Why would you get go back and wander to the world and to your own old ways of doing things? Why would you get discouraged during your hour of testing when God's glory is manifested in your sight? 24 7 2. You got a record of your answered prayers? Open that up. You saw it. Answered prayer here, answered prayer here, answered prayer here. You saw God moving in your life unlike other moments that you went through without God? You forgot that? Did you see the fruits that the Lord has blessed his church? I mean, you keep hearing the number of souls saved and you hear the amount of money that is going out to missions that we were able to do and you've seen how people, they were testifying about this church and even speakers up here who would testify about this church around the world. You see it. But we still kind of go back to Egypt, don't we? Our flesh just wants to wander, doesn't it? And it doesn't matter if a soul is saved in front of your eyes, the flesh will still go back to its same old dark thoughts in your room while you're lying down in your bed and your wife or your husband and your children don't know what kind of thoughts that are going through in your heart. And where did that come from? And that's in the middle of God's glory. In the middle of God's doing something great in your life. The middle of this joyous occasion this mighty fruit and blessing, there's still sorrow. Isn't that amazing? Will you pray with me? Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood and help me to preach, Lord. I want to help these people. Please help them, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 12 and 13, this is where it started to fall apart. It's because their leader went away and they were being tested and tried. But you would think 
after verse 9 through 11, why would they be discouraged? Verse 9 through 11, Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw, you see that? They saw the God of Israel. Haven't we sung about that? Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, face to face with Christ my Savior. Haven't we shouted about that and say, Lord, I just want to see your face. Haven't Christians have preached and talked about that just one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Haven't we talked about that, preached about that, praised God about that? And just seeing God face to face, you and I would feel like we can keep on going. If only God would reveal his face to us, then the suffering that you and I are feeling, we'll bear it a little more. We'll be able to conquer it. A lot of times you might hear some Bible believers say that the Apostle Paul, he cheated. That's why he's the greatest Christian. You might say, why? Because he saw Jesus. He saw heaven in its clearness. I mean, it's not like us in a blowout meeting where we get a glimpse of heaven. No, he saw heaven itself and those streets of pure gold and his mansion right there and then his rewards that God laid out. And you don't think that after seeing all that, that when God sends him back down, he's going to go, I'm going to work stinking hard. I'm going to stop complaining. I'm going to stop getting discouraged. I'm going to keep pressing on no matter what the trial is. Because he saw it in its clearness. Not just a glimpse like us. Not just by faith like us. He saw it in its clearness. These Jews saw it in its clearness. As clear as you can get at verse 10. And there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness and upon the nobles of the children of Israel he lay not his hand also they saw God brother sister in Christ they didn't just see God in his clearness they ate and drank with the king of kings and the lord of lords just a little talk with jesus just to eat one meal with him oh it get us going and we serve god better i just want to see in its clearness my mansion my reward and the face of my savior of course they didn't see god face to face they saw his body parts, what was below him. But still, that's as clear as you can get. And they still went back to their gods in Egypt. I thought that you said, one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase, so I will bravely run the race. I thought you said that. But you'll still... Get discouraged, you still go back to the flesh, you still will go back to your gods in Egypt, you still fail in your service for God? Yes. You know why God doesn't need to show heaven to you? Doesn't need to show you the rewards? Doesn't need to show you his face? Doesn't need to show you the streets of gold? Because even if you see all that in its clearness, you still go back to your gods. You want evidence? Wasn't summer camp the closest to heaven that you'll get? And you never felt anything like that before? And that was like heaven in its clearness. Maybe not directly face to face, but it was very clear. The preaching was clear. The fellowship was clear. This was real. And you wanted it to last forever. And then you don't want to go back to summer camp? The blowout. We saw heaven in its clearness. We saw the preacher. He sang his heart out. I'm going to die on the battlefield. You saw the altars get filled. You saw preachers coming on this altar. You went on the altar. You wept the tears. You saw it in its clearness. What God spoke to you. And you don't want to come to the blowout? You're not excited about that? You know why? God doesn't have to reward you, bless you, because you'll still go back to Egypt. That's why God is not blessing you, answering your prayer, showing you good things to keep you going, because 
If you look at church history before COVID and America in its height of prosperity, they still didn't serve God. And neither did you, did you? You thought that, oh, it's my suffering and my trial, and oh, if this pain is gone, and oh, God, if you make it easier for me to serve you and come to church, then things will get better. When God uplifted that curse and that suffering and made things easy for you, you still didn't serve God. That's why God don't show it to you. Why? Because of that fleshly nature. You know what makes us go back to Egypt and to our fleshly routine? I'll tell you one thing that will make you serve God and keep serving God. And I know what was it that these Jews had that kept them serving God. It wasn't, listen, it wasn't seeing heaven in its clearness that kept them serving God. You know what kept them serving God? I read you verse 12 and 13. It's Moses was there. Moses ministered to them, but now he's gone. Kids, I know why you're serving God. You have a Moses ministering to you, making you serve God. Church, I know why you're serving God. There's a Moses that's preaching, ministering to you to keep you serving God. Spouse, husband, wife, I know why you're serving God. Because there's a Moses ministering to you. You know why you come to this church? Because there's a brother and sister in Christ. There's a Moses that ministers to you. But... Give it a bad day, and we do have these bad days. We have these small days when certain Moseses aren't around. Certain people are not there to minister. And when you come to church, you get discouraged. You don't want to come to church. You don't want to serve God. You know why? You only came because of Moses. You only came because someone ministered to you. Someone prayed for you. Someone loved you. That's why mega churches get filled out because they feel like that someone cares for me. They're looking for a place to belong. Now, don't get me wrong. Church should be that place. We love you. We pray for you. And the pastor's job is to care for the sheep. But if you're coming only for that, then wait till God calls Moses up and says, Moses, you and I, we need alone time. But God, what about the people here? And I got to take care of that. And God's like, no, I'm more important than them. You come up with me, and we talk. And by the way, notice right here, Moses didn't minister to the people. Notice in verse 13, and his minister, Joshua, they were ministering to Moses. You know, what would get people to go back to their gods in Egypt is when they start ministering to the ministers. Why? Because they're not being ministered unto. And when they don't feel like no one ministered to them, no one talked to them, no one made them feel welcome, no one prayed for them, no one really loved them, and no one really met their needs or their trials that they're going through, they're not being ministered unto. And they feel like they have to minister to them. And when they come to church, they feel like they're ministering to others. It's not fellowship or loving fun it's the opposite you feel like you feel like you're working you feel like you're unwelcome then you feel like that oh man why bother even coming it takes a lot of work you feel like you're ministering to the people rather than them ministering to you and that will make you go real fast to Egypt wow. back to the job back to the flesh your old ways your old friends that are a bad influence in your life back to your backslidden condition Back to the gods that you used to worship, that you always live by every day. So isn't it amazing that what would get you, listen then, what gets these Jews to keep serving God is as long as Moses is able to minister to them. That's it. I thought 
seeing Jesus, seeing God, seeing heaven, would get them to keep serving God. I thought that God answering your prayer, providing you a miracle, blessing your life, would get you to keep serving God. But the reality hits. And when reality hits, it turns out that no matter if God opened up the bank account in heaven and gave you every single last drop of blessing, you still go back to Egypt. But as long as some Moses is there to carry you, to minister to you, that's the thing that will keep you serving God. So isn't it amazing? It's amazing that a minister ministering to you will keep you serving God rather than Jesus showing his face to you. Rather than you going to heaven. Rather than God blessing your life. Maybe that's why God decided not to answer your prayers anymore. You think if God got rid of all your problems, blessed your life, gave you the clearness of heaven itself, it gets you to serve God? No, reality hits. No, as long as some Moses is ministering to you, and as long as you're not ministering to Moses, but you're being ministered unto, then I'll keep serving God. Then I'll be motivated to stay faithful. When Moses don't minister to you, and the ministry falls on your hands, and you have to make up the lost numbers, and you have to come, and then you have to keep serving God, guess what happens? Then you will fall away. And even if God showed you all of heaven itself, you'd still fall away. That's what you need to let go. You need to let go of your Moses. What is your Moses? What's been ministering to you okay. that keeps you here? Then the devil, all he has to do is attack that. Right. And then you will fall away. Wow. Isn't it amazing that God can show you all the fruits and the blessings and yet we still mess up in our lives. Why is that? Because the solution is not the glory of the Lord. It turned out that the problem all along was I was dependent and relying on someone to minister to me rather than me ministering to that person. Are you ministering to the people today or are you being the one ministered unto? And that's why you keep coming, because something is ministering to you. But trust me, there are church days you don't feel like it. Are you the one ministering, or are you the one being ministered unto? When we look at uh, verse 14, And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Moses told them one thing. He said, just wait here until I come back. And you know those Jews? I really believe that their sin, the reason why they fell away, was not because of the gods of Egypt. It's not because of, oh, I want to worship a golden calf. I don't think that's what happened right here. I mean, you don't see the Jews while Moses was up there, maybe after day number 10 or after day number 20. You don't see the Jews up there worshiping a golden calf. I think, I think that as soon as Moses went up there, let's say three days or five days passed, they were still serving God and... They were not worshiping any golden calf, and they were avoiding it like a plague. Yeah. We are not going to worship a golden calf. Yeah. I really believe that. Then what made them fall away? Terry. Terry here till I come. You know what will get you to fall away? Not, not your Egypt, see? We, we blame sin too easily here. We blame the world too easily. We blame our own weakness of the flesh too easily. I'll tell you exactly how you fall away. When Jesus told you one thing, occupy till I come. As Moses said, tarry here until I come again to you. It's amazing what time will do. 
I mean, after you see the glory of God like those Jews and God has done something amazing in your life, it's not like after a summer camp or a blowout or a heavenly moment that God has given to you in your life that all of a sudden, I want to worship my God in Egypt. No, I believe that Every single one of you is sincere and want to love God and serve Him and you want to sacrifice your best to Him and give Him all the glory. I strongly believe that. After five days, like those Jews. But give it time. And time is the ultimate weakness of every human being where they will eventually fall away. Good. Not the God of Egypt, but time. Why? We are built for instant gratification. And we cannot, we cannot wait. We don't want to wait. I need it now. And that's why when you look at Exodus 32, what did those Jews say? They said, up, make us gods. You know why they went back to their gods in Egypt? They wanted something now. They wanted a solution now. They were sick of waiting. No, we can't wait till Moses comes again. I need something now. That's why we're very fleshly and we fall away easily. We're not patient. That's why suffering we fall away and we cannot endure. Because we cannot be patient. We blame the gods of Egypt too easily. No, no, no. It's because you can't wait. Okay. Look, it's only time. And time is temporary. And the blessing will come. And he will come. Life is short. All you have to do is wait. Yeah. Sometimes even, sometimes even, where you thought it's a long waiting time, Hasn't God answered it sooner than you thought? You just have to wait a little longer. We're not built for that. That's our problem. That's why we go back to our gods in Egypt. But Moses already told them, hey, here's Aaron and her. So I know I'll be gone, but if you have any matters... If you really can't wait, here's Aaron and her, and they'll help you out. Wait, they didn't even go to Aaron and her. They didn't want Aaron and her. They said, I want my God in Egypt. Wow. Why? Why would they think that? Do you know who Aaron and do you know who her is? Oh, they're just lackeys of the pastor. And No. Wow. They were the ones who held up the pastor's hand during his weak moment. Yes. They were the ones who gave strength to the pastor when the pastor couldn't give them strength. Yes. This was Aaron and her, the right hand and the left hand of Moses. I mean, what could go wrong when you got the ones who held up the hands of Moses and you couldn't wait a little longer? No, they just saw it as lackeys. Well, I know, I know, they're the right hand, left hand men, but it's not that great. I want my God in Egypt. You know, that verse at Exodus 32, those Jews, when they told Aaron to make gods, they said, up, make us gods out of Egypt. Now, you know what that shows me? They had that God in their heart all that time. It was just hiding there in the crevices of their heart and it was about to pop out any moment and they were like, I want my God. I want my God. I want my golden calf. I want my idol. I want that thing that makes my flesh comfortable. I want that thing that appeases me. That's the only solution in my life. I know it slaved me. That sin enslaved me. That taskmaster brutally ruined my life. But I want my God. Why would you want that God when... The Lord already gave you the right hand and the left hand of those that held up Moses. What better strength can you get than that? That shows me how little they think of God's help 
okay. compared to Egypt's help. They valued Egypt's help more than God's help. They valued Egypt's offer, Egypt's treasure, Egypt's God more than what God offered to them. Church, this ain't just a book. This is not just some lackey of God. This is not just, oh, it's just Aaron and her. This is God's own mouth. He didn't just write it with his hand. He spoke his word here. Yeah. This ain't just the right hand of God. This is his very own breath. Yeah. And when God says, tarry here till I come, and if you can't wait that long, here, I'll give you my word. Here's Aaron and her. Okay. They'll keep you going. If you have any matters to go to, go to here. But see, Aaron and her don't mean much to you. Okay. And you let it sit on your shelf... And then in that heart, it's saying, I want my God. Wow. I want my fleshly thing. I have that worldly thing. I have my own way. That God in Egypt, that God, that God. And that's been hiding in the crevices of your heart all that time. And finally, one day, you're going to go, oh, make us God. I'm going to go to that sin. I'm going to go to that worldly thing. Rather than your Aaron and her. Wow. You know, God gave you... A Bible-believing church. Do you know what a miracle this church is in this kind of an area? What an Aaron. What a her. That lifted up the feeble hands and gives you strength. What a miracle. But see, you thought of it as, oh, that's just, I know, I know, but it's not that great. I know God gave me something wonderful to keep me going until the rapture. I know that fellowship keeps me going. I know that the preaching of the word of God will keep me clean. And I know that getting involved in some of the stuff here at the church and soul winning will keep me going on for the Lord. But uh, it's just, uh, it's not for me. It's, it's only Aaron and her. It's something that I don't take too much value in. Is I think that golden calf is much better. And that's hiding in your heart. And, you, and that's the reason why you go back to your old ways. Because your old ways, which are your old gods, have always been hiding in your heart. And you have not believed or accepted the Aaron and her that God gave to your life. And by continually rejecting that help and rejecting that offer, the only help and the only offer that you will ever turn to is the one that was beating inside your heart that whole time. Amen. My God in Egypt. It's going to come out. You think you can keep it, <laughs> that sin down, that your old past behind you, and you don't think you're going to revert to your old ways? Oh, it's hiding in there. It's any moment of time that it's coming out if you won't finally rely on your Aaron and her. You know, two things again, why we go back to the old gods of Egypt. One, we cannot wait. We refuse to wait. And number two, we take God's help, his instructions in the word that will sustain us through suffering and trial and temptation too lightly. We take it for little value. We dismiss it. If that's the case, then God will take away the Aaron and her. And he will give you your God in Egypt because that will make you happier. As the glory of the Lord, it is manifested at verse 17. And they see it. And they see it all the time. God is working miracles. And they see Aaron and her. They saw Aaron and her. How God used them to take care of difficult matters. How God used them to lift up Moses' hand. And they were part of the miracle of getting victory against the Amalekites. They saw all of that. They were without excuse. They saw the evidence of Aaron and her. But they still chose their God in Egypt. They still belittled their Aaron and her. Now, what are your Aaron and hers that God has shown you in your very own eyes his glory? And 
you belittled them. When, when I was absent, we've seen some Aaron and hers here, haven't we? And they preached something that ministered to you, haven't they? Or did you take it lightly and say, oh, it's not the pastor? then you know what's going to happen? In the corner of your heart, it's your God in Egypt. I want to go back home. I want to go back to my old ways of doing. I got something else to do. I got my worldly stuff, fleshly stuff, my own schedule. I want to go back there. What am I doing here? And the glory of the Lord will be belittled in front of your eyes. Notice in verse 15, and 16, and Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. You know, if that cloud was not there, perhaps they would have said, look, Moses is still alive. He's not dead. So let's just keep serving God. But that cloud covered him, and they have no idea what's going on. And that cloud, it's dark, and that cloud is thunderous. It makes a very scary noise. It puts thoughts into their minds that, wow, I think our leader's dead. Don't know what happened to him. That cloud looks scary. And I don't see my leader. I don't see Moses there. I don't see my Moses there that ministered to me. And when that happens, because of that cloud, it got them to go back to their gods in Egypt. But see, it's a cloud. Do you know what a cloud is? It's thin. Just behind that thin, hardly even material, it's just vapor and gas mixed in, condensation. And if you just went behind it, it's Moses. Moses is right there. If I stood in front of you right now in this pulpit, you know that I'm here and that you'll be okay, but just put a bunch of cloud in front of me, you know I'm still here. And you know that it's so thin and there's nothing to be scared of. And I'm just right here. But see, the cloud, no matter how thin it is, it looks scary to us. It covers the thing that ministers to us, our Moses, so then we get scared and then we doubt God's promise and we backslide. Now, this world, do you understand it's only a veil? You, what you're touching, tasting, feeling, and all the problems, I know suffering is bad, don't get me wrong. Clouds, they are scary too. And they are dark and thunderous. But it's a veil. It's so thin. Just behind that physical realm, do you realize it's an abundant God that fills up the whole universe? Do you realize God is bigger than the physical elements in this universe, in this world, that your problem is so thin, it's so small, behind them. And right, just right behind that veil is a big God with eternal rewards, a mansion in heaven, and God's abundant promises just behind that veil. So what is there to fear? It's just a disguise. The thunder is just a disguise. The darkness of the cloud is just a disguise. Just right behind it is God holding your hand. And Jesus Christ still interceding on your behalf with the Holy Spirit guiding you every step of the way. This suffering, the worldly pleasures, Egypt, the gods, everything physical in this life is so thin. It's so fragile. It's just a veil that when you just go past through that thin boundary right there, 
is a big spiritual plane, much bigger than what your hearts and minds can imagine. If only you would look behind the veil and see how big our God is. See how big heaven is. See how abundant and huge his promises are. That's right, preacher. If those Jews just looked a little harder, because it's a cloud. So if they just looked a little harder, I mean, they might not see every fine detail. They could see something and see, you know, I, I see a form there. And yeah, Moses is still alive, so why would I be afraid? I still see him standing there. I see him moving. It's moving around there. So why do I have to go back to my God in Egypt? Oh, it's okay. Moses is still alive. If only they would see a little harder behind the cloud, right? Church, if you would only see a little harder behind that cloud of suffering, behind that cloud of temptation, behind that cloud of the world, if you would only look a little harder, then you would see the Holy Spirit of God moving upon your life and bringing souls to salvation and God answering your prayers and recalling into your mind how loving and real our God is if you would only just look a little harder. If you would only hear a little harder, maybe those Jews could have heard Moses talk to God out of the abundance of that music and that loud rock music of Egypt and the cap that they were worshiping. If they would only just open their ears a little harder, they perhaps would have heard Moses talking to God. If you would only open your ears in the sermon of the word of God and look behind this veil of Pastor Gene Kim and his annoying voice and just look past that veil and that thin cloud, you could see God, the Holy Spirit, reaching down your heart and touching you and telling you something that directly ministers your need. Are you seeing behind the veil? Do you see? Are you hearing behind the veil? It's just a little bit. It's just a thin thing. It's such a thin thing. The Holy Spirit is in your heart. And not only that, you're a part of him too. You're a part of his body. Can't you feel your heart beating and God touching your heart with something? ministering something to you. You just have to go past that thin, fragile veil called suffering, called the world, okay. called sin, yeah. called stubbornness, called your human emotion and human rationale. You just need to go past that veil a bit. It's so thin, it's frail. We all turn to dust, you know that. The best that mankind can do, they all still die. That's how thin they are. That's like a thin, thin veil. All God has to do is just touch it and tear asunder. But God is fixed and eternal and his promises are sure and everlasting. If a cloud was right here and you can't see your Moses, can't you just reach, stretch out your hand by faith and go through that dark cloud and then feel some Moses ministering to you? Do you are you stretching out that hand of faith right now through that veil of bitterness that veil of suffering, that veil of being just lost and ignorant and hopelessness. Can't you just reach out your hand of faith and feel God saying, I'm with you. I love you. And Romans 8, 28 still applies. You feel that? 
reach through that veil. It's so thin. You just got to stretch out your hand by faith. And just feel God. Yeah. Notice uh, verse 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. <laughs> in their very own eyes, the verse said, they saw the glory of God, the sight of the glory of the Lord. It was in the eyes of the children of Israel. Who would be so blind, deaf, and dumb to turn after a God of Egypt when you got the roaring fire and the awesome, majestic presence of God burning right in front of your eyes? Who would even be so nonsensical and mad to go after a God in Egypt? You know why? They didn't see the glory of the Lord. That's why. Yeah. You might say, no, they saw. The verse said, Pastor, and in the sight, the glory of the Lord. They didn't see his glory. The Bible says the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire. All they saw was fire yeah. Yeah. that devoured and is scary. And that's why they thought Moses died. You know, you know, God, he is manifesting his glory to you. But, and, but you know what your problem is? You don't see the glory of the Lord. All you see is a devouring fire. You know what God gave you? Wow. Salvation? A Bible-believing church? A perfect book? Brothers and sisters in Christ? And not just that, you saw with your very own eyes the fruits, the miracles, and what God is doing in this church. But you can't see the glory of God. That's the glory of God, child. Can't you see that? And you say, no, all I see is a devouring fire. And the glory of the Lord can manifest with page 67, Hail to the King we love so well, and people shouting and smile on their faces, and you can laugh, and that the Holy Spirit minister to you, and the preacher can preach the greatest sermon, and the glory of the Lord will still appear like devouring fire. And you feel like, I got to go back to my God in Egypt. Wow. This ain't real to me. I know, preacher, you kept preaching that, that it's real and there's nothing like it. But it ain't glorious to me. It's a devouring fire. No one feels like that here, right? Oh, it's so hard to serve God. It's such a sacrifice. And I know souls got saved, but man, it was such a high price to pay. And I got to work hard. I got to sacrifice much to be able to make an effort to come to church and raise my family in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm struggling financially. And I know that there are these opportunities to serve God, but uh, man, these things just discourage me and I'm unable to do it. And all you see is a devouring fire and not the miracle of God working in this place. All right, let me get a little worldly here, but sometimes you remember those uh, superhero shows, and then the superhero, he's got these awesome powers, and then you see the kids, and you yourself as a kid, you're like, man, I want to be like that hero. He's got superpowers, he can face through walls, and he, laser beams can shoot out of his eyes, and man, he's got cool gadgets and toys and weapons, and Man, I, he got the fancy cars. Man, those superhero powers. Man, I wish I was like that. And isn't it funny that in those TV shows, the, C, the superhero or the superheroine herself would see their powers as a curse, not something glorious, not something cool that the kids want? Why? Because all they see is, I'm a monster. I'm not normal like everybody else in the world. Having a normal job, normal family, normal happy things in life. 
So, wow, I wish that I would get rid of this superhero power and just be like everybody else in the world. See, it depends on your perspective. From your perspective, you could see it as the greatest, glorious thing in life. And you, out of a million or a billion, have this unique blessing and opportunity and gift that God has given to you that he did not give to anyone else. And you could see it as something that's glorious, that you're the one who got the power. You're the one who had the opportunity. You're the one that can do something great for the Lord. And he's doing marvelous things out of your life. Or you could take the other perspective and take this as this is such a curse. Why did God give me this heavy burden to do this heavy work for him? Why is it that we can't be like all the other people in the world in this Bay Area? Just be normal like them. I'm abnormal. I'm weird. Amen. Can't I just be like all the other families in this world and just have a house and stability and a job opportunity and then a good pay and then promotion and then find someone that I love and I can live happily ever after and then uh, not have all of these satanic attacks and enemies to fight? No, not to a superhero. That's the greatest thing in life. The greatest thing is you get to rescue people's, not just their lives, but their souls from villains. What a power. What an opportunity. What a privilege and a gift and a blessing. But see, it depends on your per, your perspective. You can take it as a curse, as a devouring fire, as something that's, oh, I wish I'm just like everybody else in the world. Or you can take it as, I'm so glad I'm not like everybody else in the world. That I'm the one, I'm the blessed one that God chose to do this wonderful thing for him. And it'll be recorded, not just in history books, but for all eternity in his book up in heaven. Superheroes are legends that people popularize. You don't realize that up in heaven, their accounts is more than legendary. It's eternity. And you can take it as the most glorious thing. You know, when I went to Africa, a lot of you heard about that brutal flight that I went through. But you know what? Thank God, and I could say that my brother here is a witness, and perhaps my wife too, but it didn't matter. You know, that pain and those long hours, I mean, those things, sure, but it just comes along with the job, you know? It's just a part of life. I mean, we saw souls getting saved, and then people receiving John and Romans, and what a blessing thing. I don't get that here in America. Amen. And yeah, I'm going to go back there to Africa. Great job. Amen. Oh. Blessed thing. If I have to get sick going through that, then get sick. It just comes with the job. Amen. Oh, why is this heavy task given to me? Why do I have to be the one go volunteering to Africa and pass out John and Romans? Why do I have to be the one to see 200 souls get saved? Why do I have to be part of Bible Baptist Church that can support every missionary around the world? Why do I have to be the one who has the opportunity to teach the children to teach the women to preach and minister to people on this pulpit. Why do I have to be the one to do that? Why do I have to be the one where people around the world heard about this church and ministry and ended up in Bible-believing churches and got saved? Why do I have to be a part of that? Oh, woe is me. God, why can't you make us like other churches? Thank God he didn't make us like other churches. Bless God. Praise God. Amen. I'm not saying that our church is better than any other church around the world. There are plenty of Bible-believing churches out there that are better than us. But man, the number is small. And we are so privileged and blessed what we have. And woe is you. You know, verse 18 shows 40 days, 40 nights. You know what 40 represents, right? It's a trial. 
It's a testing period. During that testing, all the people saw was in verse 17, a devouring fire. But I thank God that those Jews were wrong. I thank God that when those Jews saw God speaking to them in Exodus 20 and they were so afraid and they said, don't have God speak to us. I'm so glad that they were wrong about their fears, that they were wrong about what they wrongly thought about God, what they wrongly thought about his glory. I'm so glad that they're wrong. The scripture is true. God is true. And let every man be a liar. The Bible says the sight of the glory of the Lord. Bless God. Every word in that King James Bible is true. And when God says it's glorious, that means it is glorious. Oh, but it's a devouring fire. Oh, it's unfair. It's oh, woe is me. And oh, the world is better. Why can't I be like other people in the world? Thank God that you're wrong. And thank God the word of God is true. Oh, man, this bad thing in my life, it'll never work for good. Pastor, I know what you preach. Is, you know, you're saying all that, and people are telling me Romans 8, 28. But, man, it don't feel like it's true. Thank God your feelings are lying to you. And thank God the Word of God is true. Thank God Romans 8, 28 is still right after 2,000 years. Thank God that all the tears that you cried against God were wrong. Thank God that the complaints that you poured out your soul to him was absolutely wrong. Thank God that the feelings of your flesh that tempted you and gave you wrong thoughts and dark thoughts, that they were an absolute lie from hell. Thank you, Jesus, that your promise is still true no matter how I feel. Let God be true and every man a liar. Thank God that your feelings are a lie, that your thoughts are a lie, that your tears are a lie, that your thoughts, that your wrong perspectives, your humanity, your reason, and everything is wrong, 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 wrong. Thank you, Jesus, so much. And thank you, Lord, that your word is still true. Otherwise, I would not be alive today. Every head bow and every eye shut.